The next rule we want to look at is called the constant multiple rule. And it says that if f is a differentiable function and c is a real number, then c times f is also differentiable. And the way you find the derivative, ddx, of c times f of x is that you can take the c out of the derivative and then just take the derivative of the function and multiply it times the constant. So in other words, if you wanted to take the derivative of f of x equals 5 times x cubed, you can leave the 5, the constant, out of the derivative and just take the derivative of x cubed. Well, the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. Then you would simplify by taking the 5 times the 3 and writing 15x squared. And feel free, once you get comfortable with these rules, to skip this intermediate step and go straight to f prime of x equals 15x squared. You don't need to write that intermediate step. It's just there to help you understand where we're getting our numbers. For f of x equals 5 over x squared, and again, this is a ratio. We're going to need to rewrite it to understand how to apply our power and, and constant multiple rule. If you rewrite it, you get 5 times x raised to the negative 2. So its derivative will then be 5, constant left out, times the derivative of x to the negative 2, which is negative 2, x to the negative 3, which when you multiply the 5 times the negative 2, you get negative 10 times x to the negative 3, which is the same thing as negative 10 over x cubed is another way to write that. For f of x equals negative x, we talked about the fact that the, if f of x equals x, then the derivative is 1. Well, that means when you take the derivative of f of x equals negative x, the only difference is there is an implied 1 sitting in front of this x. So you take negative 1 times the derivative of x. Well, the derivative of x is just 1, so that's how we're getting this negative 1. So that's the constant multiple rule. Next, let's take a look at the sum and difference rules. The sum rule says that if f and g are both differentiable, then the derivative of f of x plus g of x is the same thing as the derivative of f of x plus the derivative of g of x. This should look a little bit familiar. Uh, we have a limit law that greatly resembles this. Um, basically, the moral of the story is you can split a derivative across addition. Instead of adding the two functions and then taking the derivative, which is what the left side requires you to do, instead you can take the derivative of the first function, the derivative of the second function, and add them together, which is generally the easier of the two methods. So usually in math, if you have a rule that applies to sums, chances are it also applies to differences. So the difference rule says if f and g are both differentiable, then the derivative of f of x minus g of x is just the derivative of f of x minus the derivative of g of x. So you can split a derivative across subtraction as well. So let's look at an example. Find the derivative of f of y equals 22 times y to the 61st power minus 4 times y to the 10th plus 7y minus 8 times the square root of y. If I had asked you to find this derivative before giving you the dif differentiation rules, you would have had a limit definition to find. Technically, this wouldn't be x plus h because of the variable. This would be f of y plus h minus f of y. This is not the full definition. There's a limit in front and a denominator, but that means you would have been plugging y plus h into this function. So you would have had 22 times y plus h to the 61st power minus 4 times y plus h to the 10th power plus 7 times y plus h. I mean, this is just a fraction of the limit you were going to have to calculate. And even just look right here. y plus h to the 61st power is y plus h times itself 61 times. The algebra on this would be horrible. So we're definitely not going to use limit definition to find this derivative. Instead, we're going to use the differentiation formulas we just found. So the derivative of this function, you can either refer to this as df dy, that would be an appropriate way to notate this derivative, or 
the derivative of f at y, f prime at y. Either one of these is fine, they're interchangeable. df dx is not okay because your independent variable is y in this case. Okay, so I'm going to use several of the rules on this derivative. So first of all, I notice a lot of addition and subtraction going on. Well, that means I can take the derivative of each term individually. In addition to that, every constant can be pulled out. So I'm going to do this in a couple of steps. I'll take 22 times ddy of y to the 61st power. Okay. Remember, ddy of y to the 61st means I'm about to take its derivative. I have not done it yet. Minus 4 times ddy of y to the 10th plus 7 times ddy of y minus 8 times ddy of the square root of y. So each one of these, when I take the derivative, will be a power rule application. So that will be 22 times 61y to the 60th minus 4 times 10y to the 9th plus 7 times ddy of y is just 1 and then minus 8 times, remember that square root of y is y to the 1 half. So that's 1 half times y raised to the 1 half minus 1, which is negative 1 half. Now I'm going to want to do some simplification here. 22 times 61 is 1,342 y to the 60th minus 40 y to the 9th plus 7, minus, now we have 8 times 1 half, that's going to give me a 4, and then I have a y to the negative 1 half. To get rid of the negative in the exponent, I would move y to the 1 half to the denominator, but y to the 1 half is the square root of y. So this is the derivative of this function. And again, as I mentioned, as you get more comfortable with these rules, feel free to go straight to the end product. You do not need to write this intermediate step. It's just me making sure that you know where I'm getting my numbers. Let's take a look at another example. The equation of motion of a particle is s equals 2t cubed minus 5t squared plus 3t plus 4, where s is measured in centimeters and t is in seconds. Find the acceleration as a function of time and what is the acceleration after 2 seconds. So we start with a particle's equation of motion. This is the equation that gives position as a function of time. What's the relationship between a position function of a particle and that particle's acceleration? If you recall, acceleration is the second derivative of the position function. And remember, there's no way to get to a second derivative without first going through a first derivative. So what we need is the first derivative of the position function, which by the way is the velocity function. So again, we're going to split this up across addition and subtraction, and I'm going to skip that intermediate step this time. So the first term I have 2t cubed. So I take the 3 and multiply it times the 2, that gets me 6. And then I have t raised to the new power of 2 minus 2 times 5 got me 10 t. The derivative of 3t, you'll take the 1 times the 3 for 3, and then technically this is times t to the 0, but t to the 0 is just 1. So there's no variable on this one. And then the derivative of 4, 4 is a constant, so its derivative is 0. So this is a function that gives the velocity of this particle as a function of time, which is good, but not what we're looking for. We're looking for the acceleration, so that will be the second derivative of the position function, also known as the first derivative of the velocity function. That'll give us our acceleration. So the derivative of 6t squared is 12t. The derivative of negative 10t is negative 10 and the derivative of 3 is 0. So this is my acceleration function, which will give me the acceleration of this particle as a function of time measured in centimeters 
per second squared. So that's find acceleration as a function of time. Now we need to know what is the acceleration after two seconds. So to find that, I just need to find a of two. So that will be 12 times two minus 10. That's 24 minus 10 for 14 centimeters per second squared. Let's take a look at another type of common example. We want to find the points on the curve y equals x to the fourth minus 6x squared plus 4 where the tangent line is horizontal. Okay. So this is, we're talking about a curve, so this is a graph that we're discussing. And we want to find out where this graph, where this curve, has horizontal tangent lines. And that's why this is a derivative problem, because when you start talking about tangent lines, you're discussing derivatives. So let's think about this for a second before we go through the actual calculations. This is a fourth degree polynomial with a positive leading coefficient. So what does that mean its graph should generally look like? Well, the end behavior should be up on the left and up on the right. And, the, and then this has at most three turning points. One, two, three. So this is one of the possibilities of what this graph could look like. But just because a polynomial has the possibility of three turning points doesn't mean it actually has three, three turning points. It could also just have one, in which case it would look something more along a parabola-ish shape. It is not a parabola, but it's parabola-ish. Um, an example of this one, if you have just y equals x to the fourth, this is more what your graph looks like than having the three turning points. So in each of these cases, where do we find horizontal tangent lines? Well, here on this one, on the left side, you would start off with tangent lines having negative slope. And they would stay negative until right about here. And then those tangent lines would switch to positive and then zero again. The slopes of the tangent lines would then be negative, then zero and then the slopes of the tangent lines would go back to positive. So in this particular scenario, there are three points where I would have horizontal tangent lines as opposed to this scenario. How many horizontal tangent lines would you expect to get if this is what your graph looks like? Should be just one right here. So we expect either one or three answers to this question, just to kind of give us a big picture idea of what we're looking for. So we're looking for where the tangent line is horizontal. Well remember when you're talking about derivatives, derivatives are the slope of the tangent line. Well the slope of these tangent lines when they're horizontal is equal to what? Horizontal lines have slopes of zero. So in other words this is asking you when do you have derivatives, slopes of tangent lines, equal to zero. So finding where tangent lines are horizontal is equivalent to finding where your derivatives are equal to zero. And if you want to know where something is equal to zero, set it equal to zero. So first I take the derivative. I'll call this one y prime. You could also just as easily call it dy dx. Either one's great. The derivative of x to the fourth is going to be 4x cubed minus 12x plus, and then the derivative of 4 is going to be 0. So this is the derivative of this function, and I need to set this derivative equal to 0. So we have 4x cubed minus 12x equals 0. It's a polynomial. So we need to factor out what's common to both of these. That's going to be 4x you're left with x squared minus 3. So by zero product property, either 4x equals 0, in which case x equals 0, or x squared minus 3 equals 0, in which case x squared equals 3, which says that x is plus or minus the square root of 3. So we have a lot of good information here. The question is, does this actually answer the question we've been asked? And the answer is not quite. 
because the question asks us to find the points. Now what we have are x values. Now how many x values do we have? We have three. So which of these two scenarios did I end up with? Did I end up with three, ta three horizontal tangent lines or one horizontal tangent line? Well, we got the three. So we know that this has the three horizontal tangent lines. This was not the option that we got. So we do, however, need to find the points on this curve. So we need to, let me separate this out a little bit. Uh, we have three points to find. We need if x equals zero. Now we need to plug in zero in place of x. So the question is, where do you plug zero in? Should you plug zero into the y prime equals 4x cubed minus 12x, or should you plug it into y equals x to the fourth minus 6x squared plus 4? Well, remember what it is you're trying to find at the moment. You're looking for points on the curve, and points are ordered pairs, meaning they have an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. You do not plug this into the derivative. If you plug 0 into the derivative, what you are finding is the slope of the tangent line at x equals 0. What I'm looking for is the y value at x equals 0. So when we plug in x equals 0, we get uh, y equals what, 0 to the fourth minus 6 times 0 plus 4, also known as 4. Uh, so we get 0, 4 as one of our ordered pairs. If we plug in the positive square root of 3, then y is equal to the square root of 3 raised to the fourth power minus 6 times the square root of 3 squared, and then plus 4. So the square root of 3 raised to the fourth power, think of that as the square root of 3 squared times itself twice. So that'll be 3 times 3. That's going to give me 9. So that's 9 minus the square root of 3 squared is 3. So that's minus 18 plus 4. So that gives me negative 9 plus 4 for negative 5. So my other ordered pair that I just picked up is the square root of 3, negative 5. And then finally, if x is the opposite of the square root of 3, or negative square root of 3. It shouldn't change my calculations, because if you look, all that's going to do is put negatives um, in front of the square root of 3's from the previous calculation, but in both cases, you're raising those to even powers, which will cause the negative square root of 3's to have the same result as the positive square root of 3's. So I should get negative 5 for that as well. So my last ordered pair is negative square root of 3, negative 5. Those are the three points on this curve where I expect to have a horizontal tangent line.